Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to speak here. This is a great uh, gathering, and that's even without um, taking all this amazing view into account. So um, what I'll talk about is humans as awesome compressors. And I think uh, more loyal to the title I submitted was uh, what machines can learn from humans about lossy compression. Where do I point? Uh, so this was uh, largely led by an inspiring group of, at the time, high school students uh, in the summer of 2018. They did an internship uh, with my group, Ashu, Soham, and Sean. And um, currently, they, they're on the beginning of their uh, college um, experience. And, um, and then this was also sort of mentored by, at the time, and still largely my graduate students, Shubham, Irina, and Kidar. And uh, Judy is a cognitive psychologist who joined us at some point. And um, so I'm gonna tell you primarily about this work, and it pertains primarily to image compression, but toward the end I'll try and sort of um, connect it and maybe inspire, give you some food for thought uh, for how some of this might um, have some guidance in the context of video compression. So image compression, we don't need to talk about, um, I mean, I'm sure most of you know more than I do about the nitty gritty. Uh, there's the lossless so-called, or maybe quote unquote lossless. Nothing is lossless when you represent things that are analog in space and amplitude in bits. And we can, I can give you a whole talk about why I think the current lossless is not, um, it can be made much more lossless, even with the current uh, data rates. But in any case, uh, high resolution, let's call it, versus the lossy, which is currently uh, what most of us use, and I think JPEG is still responsible for 70% or if not more of um, sort of image representation on the internet and our, our computer. Um, sorry. And uh, WebP, recently open sourced by Google, does slightly better. Again, I don't think we need to get into the nitty gritty of these schemes. What uh, I think we can agree on, uh, one point I want you to recognize is that these schemes, I mean, some view them as sort of offline schemes. They don't use any sort of um, data explicitly. They were sort of designed based on all sorts of coding principles. Uh, but don't forget that JPEG and certainly WebP have in them all sorts of metaparameters or hyperparameters that were optimized. We optimized the heck out of them based on a lot of data publicly available, a lot of our images that were out there. So, um, should we be happy is something I injected in the context of a question that was asked um, at the end of the previous session. In general, of course, uh, don't worry, be happy. But more specifically, um, let's say as information theorists, um, should we be happy with this state of affairs? And as information theorists, happiness, of course, boils down to um, you know, how close you are to achieving or delivering on the fundamental limit, okay? So you might, if you come from, as some of my colleagues, uh, not often in a complimentary tone, uh, talk to me about the la-la land of information theory. Uh, if you were to come from that la-la land, you might fantasize of this sort of a picture um, you know, there's the, way, the JPEG, the WebP, whatever we're currently using, and we might try to understand how the points that we're achieving, you know, evaluated on all sorts of data sets, how close are they to the, the fundamental, you know, say, rate distortion curve. Uh, but as many of you know better than I do, um, you know, the, these rate distortion curves are rarely uh, something realistic in, in the context of multimedia and in image compression. You rarely have the right model. You rarely have the right distortion criterion. And even if you did, 
you won't even come close to be able to even approximating the straight distortion curve. Uh, it's, it's pathetic how little we know about it, even for first order binary Markov chain uh, and Hamming loss. I have colleagues spending whole careers just on approximating the rate distortion of that. So if that's not realistic uh, to aim for, another thing you can do as an information theorist is go to your uh, prophet, <laughs> ask yourself, what would Shannon do? And what Shannon did in the context of uh, compression of English text as early as, I mean, you know, in 1948, he came up with this manifesto, fundamental limits of communication, compression. And, um, you know, so quickly after that, he was asked, okay, what can you tell us? But come on, concretely, how can we put this to use in the context of, you know, what can we do with communication? What can, like, in present systems, um, in the context of representation of, of text, how well can we do? And he tried to answer this question. So yes, he developed the framework. There's entropy, he even has entropy rate in his original 1948 paper for a Markov chain. Uh, but he quickly recognized that you can't, in terms of sort of real data, you can never talk about, um, you know, are we getting close to the optimum, right? Because the optimum is always with respect to some model. Uh, so, but you could potentially talk about, you know, how much better can we do with potentially better models uh, than we're currently employing? And so in the context of language, what he did in 1951, I think was when it appeared, um, was sort of give an achievability argument for how well we should be able to compress text by recognizing that you know all these simplistic models for like you know kth order markov model on on text doesn't come even close to capturing uh, the essence of the action of the structure of the data but also recognizing that uh, for example humans have much more elaborate and nuanced models that are based on all sorts of things uh, that they've been exposed to from birth and all sorts of common um, sort of information and cultural cues uh, that go into their ability to predict, let's say the next letter, given that they saw the text so far, you know, they can give sort of their assessment for the likelihood of the next letter being, you know, whatever it can be. And you can actually um, use that. And he did what he did kind of roughly in today's terms would be he used humans to um, get an estimate of the predictability of English text under log loss, which many of you know is then, is basically then a proxy for how well you can compress this text had you designed your, say, entropy coder under that uh, sort of probability distribution. And what he got was um, an estimate of, I think, something like in the order of 2.1 bits per letter um, which it was way, way better than what they could do then. In fact, I think only it's recently. Uh, anyone here do also text compression? I think currently, maybe recently, we reached what uh, Shannon showed us uh, is achievable in 1951 through, I think it, it was Go it's Google. We use, you know, they use a ton of text and it doesn't make, it, it's not too surprising if you consider that now Google can predict what you want to say even better than you can. So it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not surprising maybe that they can compress now better than humans, but it's only recent. But again, the moral of the story is you can use humans to talk to, to give you insight into what's achievable in principle, uh, give you insight, guidance and inspiration for what you might try to achieve in due time with our li limited ability to design uh, actual models and schemes. So with this inspiration, what we try to do in the context of image compression was provide uh, a human-centric approach to image compression. And, and what this means is we wanted to bring, so inspired by Shannon, we wanted to bring human shared language and experiences to bear on this question of how much better might we be able to do. 
um, to ut utilize humans shared knowledge um, in, in, in today's um, terms, right? Humans shared knowledge is maybe, you know, as civilization, all the stuff that we, we have collectively available on the internet. So bring that to bear and use it. Uh, and also something that we didn't have in the context of losses compression, but here also address the question of what of, you know, sort of what is the right, in a sense, distortion criterion, sort of compress in a way uh, where the quality of the reconstruction caters to human's perception of quality. So, and through that, again, you can never talk about, and maybe I won't elaborate on that on the panel, go on that rant, but you can never talk about achieving fundamental limits. That in real life is BS. But you can talk about how complacent uh, can you or should you not be in terms of potential for doing much better than you currently are. So, um, what we did was take two humans with two distinct roles, one being the describer, the other the reconstructor. The describer gets a new image, never seen, uh, but captured by us or by some other human, not on the internet, not on Facebook. Uh, and he needs to describe that new image using text to the reconstructor, the other human, and the other human reconstructor attempts to recreate uh, that image. Okay, so that's basically the experiment, of course, you might imagine this is very onerous, it takes a lot of time. So you need highly motivated and dedicated and capable people. Uh, and that usually comes in the form of summer interns. So we <laughs> deviated from our practice and, and decided to uh, accept three, uh, three high school interns who wanted to um, join us for the summer. And so their goal was, so basically it's, it's what I said, slightly more specifically, um, you had this one human, like one of these interns, they would get a new image and they would just start texting a description of the image via the, the uh, text box in Skype, okay? But the describer can only text, nothing more of that person can be seen or heard, only text. The reconstructor starts the reconstruction and the reconstructor on the other side doesn't have to um, sort of um, um, dis disconnect or disable the, the audio and video feature because it's fine as many of you know, sort of feedback in the context of, of compression or lossy compression is, is something that's of course legit because the encoding can always sort of simulate internally whatever feedback would be coming from the decoder. So, um, so as the describer is describing, they can see sort of what's going on on the decoder side in terms of where they're at at the reconstruction. And then they end the experiment when, they're sent, when the describer is satisfied, okay, good enough, or they're so exhausted that they wanna call it a day. Uh, so there's a, an example, just slightly more concretely, the original image, that's a true image that one of them took on a summer safari uh, from Africa. And then he started texting away uh, and he sees, he can use, by the way, as I said, uh, we wanna see the extent to which you can use stuff that's already available, say on the internet. So part of the text can include a URL that points to some image that exists on the internet. Uh, so he starts texting, he sees, the, the, the reconstructor had, um, what was it, Photoshop or some, some other thing, Photoscape uh, that they used for the reconstruction, which the describer could see. So based on the, you know, the reconstruction so far, he could start uh, giving some incremental uh, instructions. Okay, oh, that was good, but move it a bit to the right, slightly enlarge, elongate, and so on. And um, so that's basically it, that's the protocol. And then what we wanted to, what, what we said is, okay, now the, the size of the compressed representation then under this human encoding and decoding would be the size of the text or only five minutes. Wow. Um, how time flies when you're having fun. So, uh, so basically a compressed represent, or you know, you can B-zip that text and that's your compressed representation. 
Um, and by the way, as you might glean, you know, they didn't make a point of trying to be very succinct. They were having fun and, and, and you know, joking around. Now you might ask yourself, information theoretically, is this legit? So one, one point which sometimes you might, um, you know, uh, object to initially is this notion of feedback from the reconstructor. But again, information theoretically, it's sound whatever, as we know well. I'm sure all of you know well, whatever you can do with, with feedback is something implementable with a legit uh, scheme. The slightly, uh, there's a nuanced issue information theoretically, which is the timing. You might, cons you, might, um, you might suspect that you could leak some information in the timing. Like if you take a second between typing one letter and the next or two seconds, you could potentially leak some information through that. But that is a very negligible effect, uh, which we actually eliminated in, in a more recent work that unfortunately I probably will have not much time to mention. In any case, uh, the testing, what we did was, was compare this human compression with, uh, let's say, largely state of the art in terms of mass use WebP for the same size of a representation, okay, so the same level of compression. We, we compared human compression, WebP, and the quality of evaluation was just, we went to MTurk and we asked people to rank. So we gave them the original, the reconstruction, and we asked 100 people to rate the goodness of the reconstruction, their level of satisfaction on a scale of one to 10. And um, so here are some examples. Uh, this is, again, the WebP here. We're using WebP at a rate which results uh, and uh, you know, results in a file whose size is always slightly larger. We want to be more righteous than Mother Teresa. So always a WebP file slightly larger than that for the human compression. So that's one example. Here's another. Here's another. Here's another. In this case, for, um, they did really well in terms of rate because one of them, speaking of common language, one of them recognized that, oh my God, this is from California Avenue. So they just gave a link to the Google Maps uh, <laughs> junction <laughs> with the right uh, angle and then riffed on that. Um, here's another example. And you can see in their reconstruction, it's much more crisp, but of course the details are, are less loyal. And here's uh, <laughs> the last example I want to give to just to make you know clear that I'm not claiming that uh, humans are currently superior at everything over our current algorithms, um, but we'll get to that. So in any case, of the 13 images that they worked on, they ended up uh, being superior to WebP and often significantly superior. Uh, on 10 of, of 13 images where you might, as you might imagine, images that had facial images of recognizable people, they didn't do as well. Um, so if you want to know more about this, we're, now we have this uh, really elaborate um, version on, um, on archive, you're very welcome to peruse. We also were so excited that we made a whole website, Hack Humans as Awesome Compressors. And you're very welcome to peruse. We have some more material there. Also, some text. Uh, you have all the transcripts of all their text for all the all these image um, sort of reconstruction protocols. What I guess, um, okay, basically the conclusions are kind of um, straightforward. I guess, um, okay, nothing too new here to say. Uh, I'll, I will quickly mention, and I'll continue to talk until you kick me off the stage, uh, some subsequent work. So this was actually summer of 2018, and um, now we said, okay, we can do similar things in the context of audio. Uh, we wanted to address the question of facial image compression, like how can you actually do, you know, use insight from humans, but to do really good compression of faces. Um, to alleviate, let's say, that example that I, I've shown you, and also start to deliver on the promise of what we've seen is achievable by humans by real, legit, uh, sort of automized algorithms. So what we did was, 
we took, um, since this is such great labor, these summer interns, uh, we, we created this new summer internship for high school students, uh, calling it STEM to STEM, H standing for the humanities and the human element and getting inspiration from humans. Uh, this last summer, 2019, and we had three of the groups were dedicated to exactly these three respective um, sort of, you know, so subsequent research areas that we're currently pursuing. So one is Hack for Music, which I'll quickly say that, as you might imagine, like the way a, a human views music, right? It, they, they think about, okay, what are the instruments? What are their notes? What are the lyrics? What are the vocalists' voices? That's it. That can basically be captured in you know tabular data array of like four orders of magnitude smaller than a typical MP3, and then you can compress that with some BZIP2, and you get unbelievable compression. And in fact, that's actually realizable because you can get there's already software that gets you audio to MIDI. And then the media you can play with GarageBand, and again you're getting like four orders of magnitude um, worth of of um, audio compression over MP3, which is already an order of magnitude uh, compression. So I don't have time to let you listen to anything. I'll quickly. Are you kicking me out? <laughs> okay. One minute. One minute. Okay. So we also um, we actually also talked with. Uh, a sketch artist at Stanford. So first time I'm not kicked out of, I mean, I come to a police station for the right reasons. And uh, we talk with a police sketch artist who, and we, we look at their protocol for reconstruction and they have this, you know, multiple choice kind of sequence of questions that you can easily convert to a compressor. And, you know, you can easily see that with one kilobyte of data, you can get a very exquisite reconstruction of facial, uh, of someone's face. And now we're in the process of turning that into a compressor. Um, okay, we can talk more about it. You can actually do much better. And we're also, everything that these high schoolers did uh, in their original experiment, we now have a way of automating with code and el eliminating completely the decoder. And in fact, uh, getting way, way even better compressor. Because when you force, you know, instead of you know, just talking to write in code, you get uh, way better things. So basically, that's um, almost where I'll stop. I'll just say that everything I just said of a hack for images and hack for audio is extremely relevant. You can do hack for videos, certainly for cartoons, but also for real video. And I'm happy to talk about that more maybe tomorrow in the panel. So thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. I'm sorry I have to kick you out. <laughs>